doing this. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the second in a weekly series on poetry analysis for the GCSEs. Today, we're going to be covering a poem called Mother Any Distance, and we're going to be focusing on how to analyze language really effectively in poems. Whether you're year nine, year 10, year 11, even beyond year 11, maybe doing resets, the idea is that what we're going through today is going to help you to really understand how to analyze a poem, get into the deep sort of analytical waters, and then be able to actually write good paragraphs, solid paragraphs for your exams. So last week we covered bayonet charge and we looked at structure. So if any of you haven't watched that video yet, I really highly recommend it because most students aren't taught structure properly. And that is going to be something, let's say that you're a sort of a level six or a level seven student, or maybe even a level eight student, that's going to really help you to level up if you can talk about the structure. So check that out if you haven't already. It's in the YouTube channel and it's also in the Discord if you're part of that. But let's get started with Mother Any Distance. So um, this is a poem by Simon Armitage. Little fun fact about Simon Armitage. He's the current poet laureate for England or for the UK, should I say, which means he's like the official nationally recognized poet. Um, so when any major like national things happen, he's the poet that is commissioned to write poetry on it. And another poet, poem, uh, poem, another poet that has just had that honor previously, because it's a 10 year position, was Carol Ann Duffy, who we will be looking at in the future weeks. I think we're looking at war photographer together. Uh, are we? Okay, maybe we're not, but I might add that in because it's a great poem. So let's read the poem together first. Uh, very quick thing, which I just wanted to to do at the beginning of almost every lesson in this series is just remember that you want to have an understanding of this thing called cart wars. So the context of the poem for most of you is going to be really important to include some understanding of the poet and the social, historical, sort of cultural factors that went into writing the poems. That's really important for most of you. Double check your exam boards. AQA definitely has this. Um, you want to understand the meaning of the poem, why the poem was written, what significance that has. You want to think about repeated ideas. So the themes and motifs, you want to think about tone. Today, we're going to be focused on these two, really, the words and language devices, particularly the language devices. You also want to think about rhythm rhyme and you want to think about structure as well. So we will be covering these in the coming weeks. All right, let's dive in. I'll shut up now and start reading it. So mother, any distance. Quick thing that you might want to do is just see if you can think of anything that comes from the title of the poem. That's always a useful thing. So straight away, the idea of a mother, most of us have obviously really positive connotations to our mothers, like they're one of our providers, one of our loved ones, um, often they're inspirational for us, that sort of thing. So straight away, there's a sort of potential warmth to this. But then any distance, distance, obviously, if there's a distance between things, it suggests a separation. Mother and distance don't typically work that well together because we tend to think of our mothers usually quite closely. Any distance suggests maybe there's some sort of a separation. Personal note, I can sort of understand this a little bit because I live seven, 8,000 miles away from my mother. I get to see her maybe once a year if I'm lucky. Obviously, through the pandemic, I didn't get to see her for two years straight, which really sucked. So, um, you know, the poem from the title, especially because we know it's a relationship poem, is likely going to be dealing with something to do with family, something to do with maybe challenges or, or kind of, you know, gaps in family. OK, so that's the first way to look at language straight away. Look at the title. Think about what connotations it might have, what ideas it might have. Mother. Any distance greater than a single span requires a second pair of hands. You come to help me measure windows, helmets, doors, the acres of the walls, the prairies of the floors. You at the zero end, me with the spool of tape, recording length, reporting meters, centimeters back to base, then leaving up the stairs, the line still feeding out, unreeling years between us, anchor, 
height. I spacewalk through the empty bedrooms, climb the ladder to the loft, to breaking point where something has to give. Two floors below your fingertips still pinch the last one hundredth of an inch. I reach towards a hatch that opens on an endless sky to fall or fly. Okay, beautiful poem, really interesting. A poem that any of us can relate to actually because we all have mothers. That's part of being a human being really is having mums um, being born to them. So, so let's just dive into a few of these different things. Now, as I've said to you previously, uh, particularly in an English language video actually, Two of the major things when you're looking at language, I might do a separate video on words. I might just combine these together. You wanna to be looking for word choices and their significance. Probably we'll do this in another video to go into a bit more depth, but you know, you're looking for nouns, you're looking for verbs, you're looking for adverbs, you're looking for adjectives. You might be looking for some other things. You might be looking for pronouns or possessive pronouns, things like that. There are a few others that you might get into, but those are the major ones. Um, and with all of them, you're obviously thinking about the connotations of those words and what effects they have. Then you've also got to be looking for language devices. There's a long list, you know, of language devices that I recommend. One of the places to check out would be uterine.com slash techniques. There's a lot of the major devices that you would need there on my website. Uh, but other than that, let's just keep it really simple for today. You're going to be looking for things like metaphors and similes because Poetry is a spoken art form pre predominantly. You're also going to be looking more at the what's called phonology of the words. So that's just a fancy way of saying how the words sound. So alliteration, sibilance, plosive sounds, consonants, that sort of thing. Um, on top of that, you might find some, you know, juxtaposition. You might find some some interesting imagery generally that isn't necessarily a metaphor specifically. And I could go on, but let's leave, leave it there for now and let's see what we can find. So as we come to look at this poem, Mother Any Distance, let's give ourselves a question to answer just to make it a little bit more simple. But as I'm going through the analysis, I'll also broaden it out, particularly for you, those of you that are doing this as a poetry anthology rather than thinking of this as, as an unseen. But let's just talk about how our relationships presented um in uh in the poem so that's roughly the question we'll answer we'll try and do a model answer at the end if we have time which hopefully we will the model paragraph so any distance greater than a single span requires a second pair of hands this one here you probably notice straight away has some sibilance or what you can call sibilant phonology S sounds basically. Now the S sounds, as you know, typically create a sense of hissing. That's the more negative side of sibilance. That relates them to serpents. That goes all the way into religious connotations and stuff. The serpent, the snake, betrayal, sinister, all that stuff. Now in this instance, I'm not so convinced that this is necessarily meant to be fully a sinister thing. It could be because I do think that in the poem, there is a little bit of a sense. Now, most of you as teenagers probably have either felt this or will feel this of kind of wanting to get away from their mums and, and dads, their families a little bit. Um, so there could be a little bit of frustration in this idea that the poet, the poet, poetic voice is so attached to their mother. Yeah, there could be a little bit of frustration. Now, you know, a lot of you, like I said, might feel that sometimes. They might feel that their parents can be a bit overwhelming sometimes, a bit overbearing. And it's quite healthy and normal, especially as a teenager, to want to kind of create your own identity separate from your parents. So talk about getting deep straight away into this first piece. We've got that sibilance. It creates perhaps a little bit of a frustration in the tone of the voice. Um, the other way that you could think about it Sibilance often creates more of a sense of whispering. So is this a whispered tone or whispered volume? If that's the case, what you could be seeing here is more of almost a sadness, a regret. The fact that there has 
been created this distance between the the uh, the poetic voice. I'm not going to say son or daughter because I'm not 100 percent sure, but but the distance there between the mother and and the and the child, and the whispered volume might start to hint at a sense of regret. Very important for you to understand, all of you, that there's normally not. This is what I love about the subject. This is possibly what some of you might hate about English. There isn't necessarily always a black and white, yes and no clear answer. Most of English is sat in the gray. And I love that because then there are different interpretations you can come up with. And, and I, I think that's great. But others of you, you might find that a bit frustrating, just like give me an, a clear answer. But it could be either of those things, I think. It could be a frustration trying to get away. It could be a regret. It could even be both. Because if we think about this poem as looking back, on a, the, the, the relationship between mother and, and child of the past, then it could be that at the time there was this frustration to get away, but now there's this regret or this lamentation or this sadness of the distance that has grown between them. And in some ways, like I said, I don't wanna make this poem about me by any means, but I can sort of understand that because as a teenager, I was always trying to push my parents away, always trying to do my own thing, very independent. And now I live thousands of miles away, like I said, and um, and and uh, I, I miss my parents and I, I love them. And, and it's, you know, it's hard sometimes to be this far away. And I think a lot of us, uh, a lot of us will feel that even if we live close by, there is this distance that grows between you and your family, of course, because you become your own person. The acres of walls, the prairies of the floors. So the acres of walls. Um, this is really more of a word choice. That's why, you know, like I said, I might do a video on word choice as well, but acres, this is, you know, descriptive language. In this case, it's just describing actually a literal noun. It's a thing. An acre is a, a portion of land. But the connotations of this are space. If you have acres of walls, there's this huge space. Now, again, there's a few ways we could look at this. We could link it back to when you're a little child, like a baby or a young toddler. A house, even like a modest sized house, feels massive because you're so small. The other thing, it could be the acres of walls might be more linking to moving out from the parental home. The idea that any space that you have for yourself feels really big and luxurious because You've been used to having like one bedroom in a house, maybe, maybe even sharing a bedroom or something in a house, right? So then to have your own space and your own freedom, the acres of that, connotations of space, obviously that links to the distance in the poem too. Then I really like this bit, the prairies of the floors. So this one here is a metaphor because prairies, it links to prairie land, which actually links to the wild west or to America mostly, historically. So as the European settlers went over to America, um, there's all this prairie land filled with just space and buffalo and trees and mountains and rivers and beauty. So the prairies of the floors, this metaphor, remember with metaphors, it's comparing a subject to something for a deliberate effect. In this case, I think comparing the floors to prairies creates, yeah, it'd be good if I could spell, thank you, autocorrect, uh, shout out to autocorrect. The prairies creates a sense of hope, freedom, and uh, possibility. So as the European settlers came over to America, there was this possibility and this freedom that they had from leaving, um, you know, leaving England and, and France and other European countries. So I think that in why he's doing this, Armitage, is I think to show this freedom that comes when you do leave your family home, this freedom that comes as you build your own identity as a person, as an individual outside of your family unit. Because most of you as teenagers, most of your identity is still wound up and bound up in your family. There's nothing wrong with that. It's normal. But as you get older, you become more and more your own independent um, entity. OK, uh, I'm going to change that to British English since we're British English. You at the zero end, me with the spool of tape. So this is, again, 
an interesting image. It's got some symbolism in it. I think that this now establishes that the poem is more about a son or daughter probably moving out and a mother helping that son or daughter move into this new home. Because the spool of tape, that's an image of a measuring tape. Yeah. You at the zero end, me with the spool of tape recording length. So think about pregnancy. The mother is the zero point, the foundation, right? You grow inside your mother. And then there's an umbilical cord, obviously, which feeds you as the baby. So there's this parallel in this image. So it's a symbol, symbolism as well, of the mother being the zero end, the source, the beginning of the life, and then the child slowly unspooling, unreeling, and, and growing out from that mother. Now, the umbilical cord is a fairly short-lived thing, obviously, you, you have that cut when you're born, but then that becomes a bit more, as I say, symbolic, this idea that the mother, even when, you know, after the umbilical cord is cut, you still are attached very closely to your mother, possibly your father, your parents, your guardians, because they are still your providers, right? So there's this attachment, your parents are the zero end, and then you are the one that sort of pulls out the tape, measures things, goes off. So it's a really clever image of the independence or the growing independence of a child from its family. Okay, I tend to go a bit crazy here. We still do have 10 minutes though, luckily, so we should be good for a couple more here. There's tons more. Um, as well on top of these, but I just tried to pick out some of the really key ones. Anchor, kite. So now this is what we can call extending the kind of metaphor really, okay? So extending the metaphor of the, the child uh, being attached to the mother or the parents, in this case, the mother, I'll just put mother, because of course a kite is on a string and it flies and it's fairly free, right? But it is still anchored and grounded to something else. And that anchor gives a sense of stability, but we then need to think about the connotations of these words as well. An anchor can feel, is, is stable, which is good, but also it can feel heavy and burdensome, which is bad. So again, as we think about this, think about yourselves as teenagers, sometimes you probably are grateful for the weight of your parents, the fact that they do provide you with that stability, hopefully, you know, a, a safe space to grow up in, and so on, right, and, and, and someone to talk to about your problems and whatever. But sometimes they also probably feel a bit overbearing, they feel like a weight on you. And you just want to be a kite sometimes you just want to fly fairly free. But of course, you can't fly fully free as a kite because you are tied to, tied to the ground, to the anchor, to whoever's holding on to you. So this is a really interesting extension of that metaphor of the mother being the zero end and the child pulling away through the measuring tape, through the spool of tape. A spool is just like a wound up kind of, you know, like you get spools of, of twine and spools of cotton and spools of measuring tape and so on. It's just a wound up um length of something so this is then an extended metaphor now this is pushing it but you could even call this a conceit so a conceit is when you're when a poet uses a particular image to constantly play around with an idea so this idea of you know an anchor and a kite a measuring tape and the spool that pulls out of it um then i think links to this final Point that I will talk to you about, which is reaching towards a hatch that opens on an endless sky to fall or fly. So think about a kite. A kite is going to want to reach out of a hatch or out of a window and fly away. It wants to be free into an endless sky. This also then links back to the prairies of the floors, the fact that there's all this potential and hope and freedom and possibility. Do you see how it all matches together? And to fall or fly, this then extends the metaphor into another area because 
to me, I think that clearly links to, it's a metaphor of a bird leaving the nest, okay? Bird leaving the nest. So you might have seen some David Attenborough or some National Geographic or something like that, or maybe you've seen it in real life. Just, it's quite sweet, really. The little sort of hatchling birds, the sort of chicks, the, the small birds, getting ready to fly out of the nest for the first time. And it must be terrifying because, you know, if the bird hasn't developed enough strength in the wings, then it's not going to manage to use its instinct to, 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 to survive. It might fall out of the nest, injure itself, even, even die to fall or fly. But in a way, isn't that what we, all of us do? We, we end up um, in a situation where all of us, to some extent, really fall or fly because we all have to leave home eventually. We all have to leave our mothers, our fathers, our parents, our guardians. Um, there's also the F phonology in here as well. F sounds, F phonology, which I, again, I feel creates a kind of a whispering, possibly a sinister tone. And I think that that adds to the gravity of a child leaving home, this big moment. It's good, but it's also kind of, you know, frustrating. It can be sad. It's got all of that mixed up into it. So the metaphor of a bird leaving the nest to fall or fly, this links to the, uh, it's perfect parallel with children leaving home. To go to university, to get their own place, to start work, to travel whatever yeah it's linking to that as well so that's about all i have time for within the confines of this lesson but do you see what i'm doing here is is exactly the same in each case we've gone through some phonology we've gone through some metaphors we've gone through some symbolism we've gone through some imagery what i've given you is more than enough to write a really good either full essay or comparative essay for this poem um, but, the, but what you do is the same in every case, basically. So what you do is you, you think about what type of technique is in the language, yeah? Then you look at what thoughts you have. So for some of you, you might have a different thought about the prairies of the floors. For you, the prairies might be a place, well, this is a good thing for me to add actually to this, um, a place of danger as well. Because also when the European settlers came over to America, there was extreme danger. There was a native population of people who were not happy in many cases for those settlers to be there. And rightly so, that was their land. Um, there, were, there were wolves, there were bears. So there's also potentially danger in this. So either way, the process is the same. You think about what is going on with the image or what is going on with the language, and then you try to articulate the effect that that has. So let's come back now just to finish out the lesson. As usual, I haven't given myself enough time really to do this, but how are relationships presented in the poem? And I'll try my best to write something meaningfully about language for you, just so you can see a, see a kind of a model to this. Now, the way I'm going to write this is more like an unseen poetry uh, paragraph, but you could literally take these same ideas and put them into a poetry anthology piece if Love and Relationships is your anthology. Shout out to at least a couple of my students in here that I know that is the case. So one of the ways in ways in which the uh, relationship within the poem is shown is through a mixture of excitement and danger. We note this in the phrase. Um, anchor, oh, anchor, right. the symbolic and metaphorical language here in, in this ending image to the stanza. Portrays a sense of excitement, the flying kite has a great deal of freedom and uh, joy. However, also danger, since without an anchor, a kite that 
can fly off uh, is at the mercy of the winds and other elements and likely will crash and become damaged. Throughout the poem, Armitage uses imagery of um, a stable uh, origin and juxtaposes it with an expanding um, an expanding element such as a kite or a uh, spool of tape. By doing this, as the reader, we can empathize with the process of a child leaving home or establishing their own identity. I'm going to leave context just because that's all I've got time for, I'm afraid, but hopefully that gives you a starting point. We've taken some language, we've explained it quite well, and then we've started to link it. So hopefully that's helpful. If you like the video, please leave a like. And uh, if you have any questions, please comment. Thanks very much. I will see you again next time.